I'm Jen Brandt and I am a social worker and I serve as AVMA's Director of Member Wellbeing Initiatives. I focus on individuals in terms of what helps them thrive and I also look at workplace culture, so what helps teams and organizations produce and create healthy work environments. When we think about psychological safety, we think about an environment where I feel included, I feel safe to learn, I feel safe to contribute to the team, and I feel safe to challenge the status quo. Psychological safety is extraordinarily rare. We don't often see this in the workplace. It's defined as the team's belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. We might look at a team or a workplace and say, oh, that's just how they are, right? That's just how we do business. But when you start to look at it through a lens of psychological safety, you step back and say, if you were an observer of this team, would you see everyone, for example, at a team meeting feeling like they could participate? Are you hearing from everyone's voice or is the power to speak and share information limited to just a few individuals on the team? We tend to view everyone else's perception of safety and what works for them and what helps them thrive through our own lens instead of being more curious about what helps other people thrive. An essential first step is to kind of check in with our own self. What does it mean to have psychological safety for us? But then how do we translate that and how are we ensuring that other people's needs are being met in the process? How we tend to look at issues, right, is a definition that often we made up. So when we reframe information, it has a potent effect on us because it actually calms our neurological system, it reduces our level of stress, and increases our capacity to take in new information and try new ideas. One of the things I have people consider is, you know, think about a time that you made a mistake and you realize that your automatic default is, I'm a terrible person, nobody likes me, I'm never going to amount to anything. And then imagine if we had that experience, but it was with a team that says, hey, this is great, you are willing to try something new and let's you know, deconstruct that and what can we learn from it. One area of reframing that I see play out really powerfully in veterinary medicine is a well-established veterinarian who makes a medical error. When we view failure as just pure shame, we're not gonna share that with anybody, but think about how powerful that can be if that's a teaching tool and a way to model failure as an opportunity for growth if we allow it to be. So we encourage people, if you really want to dig a little deeper, think about converting those why questions to what questions. An exercise that we can do with that is called the rule of six. Let's say we had a negative interaction with a colleague and the first rule that we come up with is, well, it's because they're a jerk. Well, what if there's another explanation? So a second rule might be maybe they aren't feeling well, so they just responded differently than they typically do. And so we would keep going through that list of possibilities until we potentially have six. And really the magic of that is it just, it encourages to stay curious instead of having that sense of absolute certainty about a guess or an assumption that we've made that may or may not be at all the case. One of the things that we need to really remember in inclusion safety is that not everybody has the same experience that we have. So inclusion safety would be that I am valued, my perspectives are considered, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every idea that I bring to the table will be implemented. And then the other way that we can take a look at that is what does inclusion safety mean for every other member of the team? What allows you to feel like you can engage without ridicule. One of the common tenets that many of us grew up with is the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have done. But what it doesn't do is consider the needs of somebody else. So we ask people to consider the platinum rule. Do unto others as they would have done. We often will give lip service to, well, of course we want diversity, equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging. But I think sometimes we have to dig a little deeper. I think it is important for people to be really clear on what motivates them to do that. If it's to be socially accepted by other people, then that is likely not going to be a motivation that will carry you through. If it's that I really believe in diversity of thought, and I really believe that when people feel included, they are more likely to fully engage Age when they are here so we get the best of them while they're here. That purpose will often fuel us even when we're encountering some mistakes and road bumps along the way to that process. 
you essentially need psychological safety in order to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also a workplace that truly models diversity, equity, and inclusion will have an outcome or evidence of that be psychological safety. Part of it is just being willing to, again, recognize that your experience is not the experience of someone else. And I think that blind spot that many of us have is one of the most difficult hurdles to overcome. Recognizing that even though I have never experienced that, am I willing to believe that that is somebody else's story? If somebody tells you that that is their experience, believe them give them the benefit of the doubt, even though that's not your lived experience. It's not like there's a finish line. We don't get to say, oh, we've achieved equity today, good. Now we can go on to something else. We are talking and asking and calling for people to establish diversity, equity, and inclusion as a core foundational value. It becomes your North Star to keep your path true and honest, even when it is difficult.